Steve, you know, the one thing that humans can do that really is godlike is procreate, you know? A male and a female can get together and create another human life, you know, which is just an incredible miracle if you think about it. You know, we kind of take it for granted, but the fact that we're able to procreate and have children is the most amazing thing that we can do, and it's the closest that we really come to, to being godlike in, in a way. And so it makes sense to me that that would be the thing sexuality, human sexuality and procreation is the thing that the demons are the most interested in perverting, you know, and so it's it's not too shocking to me that, you know, we've seen such a rise in, in homosexuality and, and all this activism for same-sex marriage. I mean, the things that are, are the most precious and the most godlike are the things that they're going to target and try to pervert and, and twist. You know, and the word evil spirits, you know, the Greek word is poneros, and, and that's where the word pornography comes from. I mean, that's the same root um, that, that we're looking at. And it really is a wickedness uh, that, that that is kind of virulent. And, you know, the, also they're called unclean spirits. It has a moral connotation to it when you read it in the Gospels. So, you know, it, it totally makes sense that, sexuality is is one of their targets and one of their main interests because it really is you know the way humanity uh continues the species it's the way that that we are the most godlike and if you think about parenting you know the way we have a relationship with children you know children get their concept of god largely from their relationship with their human father and, and you know so when you look at the breakdown of the family uh, these things are not an accident. These things are being done by design, and, and it really is a demonic design. And if you look at what's happened in America as the culture is disintegrating, you know, half the kids don't know who their father is anymore and, and, and things like that. I think these things are, are definitely not just accidents. You know, I think that this has been a product of, of demonic design, of targeting, uh, and it really is kind of, crumbling the moral foundations of society and and really we're we're just ripe for the insertion of the doctrine of demons <laughs> well and and what's interesting even even in the history of giants through the british isles uh it's fascinating to me that it, what's really interesting okay and i tell people this if you want to know where the history of uh, same-sex sexual encounters came from. It came from the uh, the giants, and it's fascinating because I forget which, uh, maybe it was uh, Diodorus wrote, and I'm going to, you know, uh, one of thousands of footnotes in my book, but he wrote, even though the Celtic giants had beautiful women, they preferred the company of one another. Same wow. thing in Patagonia, and Patagonia literally means big feet not like Bigfoot, the Sasquatch, but what, what's fascinating to me and tracking this stuff, the common core, the common center, you basically, i got to be blunt with you, it boils down to this. It boils down, bottom line, to a, a sexual uh, desire. I don't believe the aliens have a sign someplace past Alpha Centauri going, if you're lonely, go to Earth, Earth women are easy, okay? <laughs> the bottom line is is that, and I'm sorry to try and be so blunt, but I find any more, Chris, you're a scholar, okay? So you can talk in, in the terms you grew up with. But what I'm trying to get across to people, and, and thank God for guys like you, because guys like me can basically come along and say, oh, this is what he's really saying, and be kind of blunt, okay? But not at the, at the expense of being uh, uh, lurid or disgusting, but at the expense of telling people the truth. And what's fascinating and becomes even more fascinating is this. In my book, Xenogenesis, I quote a bunch of scientists, and i got to tell you, you would think these guys are absolutely have the appetite of demons expressed through humans. They're not interested, I mean, they're not just interested in human females. They're, in this, they're interested in genetically altering for their own perverted pleasure uh, I would call them composite furry organisms, okay? Kind of like Spawn. Did you ever see the movie Spawn? Yeah, I did. 
did did you notice how a glob at the beginning turns into a fallen angel at the end? You know, with the wings and stuff. You saw that that giant being with the the wings. I thought, yeah, I did. You know, yeah. yeah. And so, and and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, probably the, one of the most disturbing, but truly, uh, I would say this insightful and 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 just to bring the bottom line up, this is what the plan is. Before they destroy every last man, woman, and child, and Jesus did say that, did he not, Chris? If the days weren't shortened, there would be no flesh left alive. Yet That's for the yeah. elect's sake, those days are going to be shortened. But it's, it's interesting. It's like they're going to get everything they can that they need, trying to become what they could never be. I'm talking about the fallen angels and their composite entities. And then... They're going to do everything they can to provoke God to judge the earth because of the sin they absolutely are the progenitors of, and they somehow think they will be prevailing. And so when you're talking about that which we wrestle against, you know, whether they're archons or cosmocrators or the things, those are, excuse me, those are the Greek words that Paul is talking about, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, and heavenly places. The point is, is that we're now at this this, I would say, fitful and fateful point in history where one time it may have been mythology, or forgive me, we may have looked in retrospect as mythology. It's another thing when it becomes a daily encounter, and based on what I see in your book and just reading, you know, the chapters that you sent me, and I mean, the description of the chapters, I have not read the book, I will read that book. The point being is, is that we are now in, a, in a, I guess you'd say, not necessarily a no man's land, but we're where the class, here's where we're at. We're at the perilous time where the classic denial and ignorance of the professing religious world will not have the power to enable its followers to cope. And if they can't cope, they will be destroyed by it. I'm saying cope and overcome. Coping comes from the Spirit of God giving us hope, coming from the victory, His peace that surpasses all understanding. The victory comes through the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, not loving our lives unto death. But the point being is that what I see is that we are now there, and you started the, the interview, and I think you see the lateness of the hour, too, do you not? Well, yeah, absolutely, Steve. Um, you know, all these things are converging, as I said. And, you know, one of the interesting things in the book you know is i hit this this idea that that everything demonic is increasing as the christian power structures in western culture are going away you know i think that you know a lot of people have talked about the restrainer uh in second thessalonians you know where where people you know there's been a debate in the church of what is the restrainer is it the church itself or you know does it mean that we're raptured out of here and this kind of takes the restraint off or is it the holy spirit um you know or it could be perhaps it's a, it's some sort of angelic uh, opposition to evil that is lifted uh, i think michael that's where I, yeah michael yeah that's where I came down with it after studying Second Thessalonians chapter two. Is you know I, th I think the restrainer is probably an angelic uh, re restraint, and you know I think in Revelation twelve you see that there's a war in heaven, and you know a lot of people have misinterpreted Revelation twelve, and I was one of them. I would just go ahead and admit it. For a long time, I thought that. You know, Revelation 12, it talks about Satan being cast down to earth. Now, there's been a debate in the church about when that happened. And so a lot of people, and I, and I had this opinion for a while, because if you read Revelation 12, it's a flashback, because it goes back to the birth of Jesus, and it talks about, you know, the red dragon is there trying to devour him as he was born. And then, you know, he chases the woman into the desert. And so you have all this symbolism and the timing, it does go back to the birth of Christ. So it's, you know, where where are we in this in this flashback? And so a lot of people think that the devil was thrown down to earth at the cross. And I kind of thought that for a while. But then I started, I reexamined the passage when I was working on this book, and, and I came to a different opinion. And I'll tell you why. Um, the, 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 the result of the devil being thrown down to earth is not from the cross. It's actually from the war in heaven, and it's when Michael uh, overcomes. This is when the, the angels in heaven uh, cast him down. And then you see that there's a hymn 
where they sing in heaven and they say, you know, they, they, they give a whole bunch of, of qualifications. And so for the things that are going to happen, the result of the war in heaven is Satan being cast to earth. It's not, you know, our Christ's victory over sin is the turning point of, of, of for humanity, but the turning point at the end times is the end of the war in heaven when Michael and his angels prevail and Satan is cast to earth. So it's a different uh, time scale than I used to think. So for that reason, I, I changed my mind and, and see that as a future event. So I absolutely think that that's going to play out, and I think it could play out at any time, and it'll be a game changer when that war in heaven is over. Now, I know Gary Stearman has written about these these noises that people have been hearing as potentially maybe this is you know indicative of the war in heaven that's breaking through from another dimension. Um, you mentioned this concept of the alien savior and the, in the work that Tom and I did in Exo Vaticana. Well, I think that that could literally play into that scenario as the contra explanation for what's going on. I don't think Satan's going to pop up on earth and say, hey, I'm the devil. Um, yeah, I think he's going to present himself as an angel of light. He's going to be the good guy. He's going to come to save humanity. It's going to be a different story. You know, evil doesn't necessarily have horns and a tail and a pitchfork. It usually looks appealing. It usually is enticing. And it even can appear to be moral. It can appear to be, you know, the best thing for humanity. Or I'm going to solve all your hunger problems. I'm going to give you free energy. I'm going to cure all your diseases. You know, it's going to be an appealing story. So that's one of the reasons I think that this hypothesis that it could come in the ruse of a benevolent extraterrestrial has a lot of explanatory scope. And, I, you know, I say that for many reasons, but if you think about how much indoctrination has gone on in the culture, especially, you know, ever since the 1940s, we've been bombarded with flying saucer movies and stories about aliens. And, you know, what I call in the book Exo Vaticana, I call it the alien savior mythos. I mean, there is a mythology that is just rich in our culture about benevolent extraterrestrials that are, are going to save us. And, and this goes way back. Um, and it really goes back from all the angst from the nuclear area, you know, where everyone was afraid of the, the, the arms race with the Soviets. Everyone was afraid that we were going to nuke the whole planet and, and wipe everybody out. And that was a very real fear that people had. But, you know, when I, I've been studying, you know, a lot of ufology lately. I've, I'm actually going to speak to the MUFON group in Los Angeles this weekend. I'm going to be speaking at the Burbank Theater in, in Los Angeles to a largely secular group of UFO researchers. And I'm going to be, you know, giving them some information they might not want to hear <laughs> because I'm not a believer in benevolent extraterrestrials. And I'm going to try to put a stone in their shoe so hopefully some of them might wake up and, and see this for the deception that it is because I think that, you know, the sort of story that we're getting from the contactees and the abductees is indicative of the kind of phenomenon we're dealing with, and it's, it's deceptive, and it, it is leading people to this uh, monistic, one-world uh, belief system that I'm talking about. And, you know, it's really interesting uh, how much uh, you see it, it all fit together because, you know, people describe the, the aliens. You've mentioned Whitley Stryber. Of course, you know, he, he came out sometimes just, you know, blatantly saying it was demonic. He said, these have to be demons. I, I remember reading that in one of his books. He, he was absolutely sure of it at one point. But then if you listen to him nowadays, sometimes he sounds like he believes they're here to help us in our spiritual evolution, and they're good guys. He's kind of flip-flopped quite a bit. And, you know, I think that's the big deception is that they are really here to keep us from nuking ourselves. They're going to give us free energy. They're going to, you know, save the world. And this is what people like Stephen Greer, you know, tend to believe. And, and if you look at what Stephen Greer's doing, you know, he's going out in the desert and meditating and, and calling down these orbs. And it just, it, it's so obviously um, occultic and, and, and demonic. I mean, 
it, it, it's really sad today because he seems like he he wants to have good in, intentions and he thinks he's going to help the planet. Uh, he thinks that they have this free energy technology and they're going to you know get us away from these oil barons and these people that are you know kind of enslaving us for their own profits. And so he sees himself as someone fighting for freedom, but he doesn't realize that the entities that he's dealing with are, are deceiving him. And and that's sadly the way I think it's going to play out. Now, you know, I, I think that the whole alien explanation just has a lot of explanatory scope, especially for how all the people in the world with all these divergent worldviews, you know, what's going to make the, the naturalist atheists and the Buddhists and the New Agers and the Muslims all stand up and pay attention to one guy who claims to be God. It's really hard to imagine uh, a worldly explanation for that. Um, but, you know, if, if something lands, <laughs> you know, if a flying saucer comes down and, and says, hey, this is my representative, you know, I think that would be one way a human being could be empowered where the whole world would pay attention. Um, it would be some kind of connection to uh, an extraterrestrial technology or, or presence. And so I think that that has a lot of explanatory scope for why the world would fall in line under one man who claims you know, to, to be divine even. Uh, so I think the Antichrist, I'm not saying the Antichrist is an alien, but I'm saying I think he will derive his power from some sort of connection to the, the extraterrestrial.